Hassan, thanks for joining us. It's lovely to see you, to talk to you again. Feels like every time we talk, we're so much, just a little bit closer to the World Cup. Uh, and so it's interesting to see how much has been done in that time. So for those of you who don't know from the long title, uh, Hassan is the World Cup guy, essentially. One of the guys, yes, but it seems like I'm the spearheaded one. <laughs> Well, so here's the question that I've been asked a bunch of times by folks over the past couple of days who maybe this is their first time in Doha. They say the stadiums are built, yep. the metro is operational, there's this regional air shuttle system plan that's you know, going to go into effect, that's cool. The roads, meh. But also, um, what is not done? What's keeping you up at night? I don't know if it's the roads, so tell me what it is. Well, to start off with, let me apologize first for my voice. As you can see, that keeps me up away, you know, at night sometimes. Uh, what keeps me up at night? I mean, look, you know, for the last 12 years, it's been different things, right? You know, starting off from a global pandemic to a lot of other things. But the fact is, as you said, you know, we're more or less there in terms of infrastructure. Yes, the roads, if you look at the insides of, the, of, you know, of some of the streets, I think there's a bit of an upgrading system that's occurring that was always part of the plan. But the major infrastructure has already been, been constructed, been completed. Um, and I think we're now in operational phase. So in the operational phase, obviously, there's a lot of different elements. One of them, of course, is accommodation, ensuring that the itinerary relevant for the accommodation is in play uh, ahead of time and trying to manage as much as possible um, uh, or avoid price gouging. I mean, obviously, you know, market, market forces always uh, mean that as, as, as long as there's a lot of demand, prices skyrocket, and we've seen it in many previous tournaments. We're trying to create an environment where the business community benefits, but at the same time, it is affordable and accessible for the fans as well. So to try to create that environment, that balance, sometimes is tricky. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that, because I want to ask you about accommodation. Go ahead. Uh, I was on the website last night. I was looking at kind of all the alternatives out there. There are some very, very pricey ones, over $1,000, multiple thousand dollars a night. Then there are some that are kind of out in the middle of nowhere, you know, I think there is a concern from fans who are looking to come here that their accommodation is either going to be extremely expensive or there's not going to even be enough for them. Um, you know, are you seeing an impact on demand and purchasing tickets from some of these concerns that fans are having? What do you mean by that? Are you seeing them, you know, sign up for tickets, not go and pay for tickets because they're concerned they can't find a hotel no. room or it's too expensive? Not at all. I mean, in terms of demand, to start off with, I think it's, it's, it's record-breaking demand. I think the last phase we had about 27 million requests for uh, about 2 million t uh, tickets available. I think about 1.2 uh, million tickets have already been uh, purchased. Okay. Um, so people are actually buying and people are excited to come. Uh, th there's no doubts about that. Uh, in terms of availability, we've tried to ensure that we provide different offerings on different categories. So from the affordable, which ranges about, you know, from $80 to $100 a night, all the way to, as you said, a bit more of the pricier ones, whether we're looking in terms of, you know, five-star hotels, mm -hmm. or even some of the luxury offerings in terms of cruise ships. So we're trying to create a wide range that, that caters for everybody. Um, of course, again, you know, more and more hotels are coming into the pipeline, and this takes time, of course, for, for, for fans to get um, more accommodated with the platform, because our offering is slightly unique as well. What we try to do is, to a certain extent, not, not within what's available in the country, but what's available on the platform, centralize a bit of what's available on the market. And again, that was at an attempt of not regulating prices, but managing prices in there. And again, the, you know, because as we've always said, we've always committed to the, this being an accessible, affordable tournament. Yeah. And so it's, it's uh, as I said, I mean, that there is, you know, I won't say it's a challenge, but it's definitely something that we're working on very hard to ensure that this is an environment for everybody from every walk of life to be able to come and enjoy it. I mentioned the regional shuttle system earlier, and the idea is essentially that someone could fly in from Dubai, Muscat, uh, Kuwait City, various cities in Saudi Arabia, and then come for the day and then leave. How much are you actually encouraging this to happen? You know, if you go back to 2009, 2010, we've always said one thing. This is an Arab Middle Eastern tournament held in Qatar. So for us, we've always, you know, we've always encouraged the fact that for a lot of these fans, this would be their first opportunity to ever come to the Middle East and the Arab world. So for them to be able to travel, visit different parts of the, of, of, of the country, different parts of the region, experience Arabic hospitality, experience our culture, um, experience our sense of humor, our, our, our welcoming nature, it's, it's, it's as much for the region as it is for, for, for Qatar. So there's no doubts, of course, you know, people will be here to, to follow the tournaments, but whenever they get the chance as well to visit the region, it's, it, it only uh, uh, serves to, to help us in our vision, which we always said, 
it is an hour of tournament, first and foremost. Even if it bites at revenue a little bit. I, look, I, th I think, you know, if you see our, uh, over the last, I think, you know, decades, we've always looked at the bigger picture. You know, in the end, you know, I, th I think, or at least, I think the way we see it, you know, prosperity is through uh, um, uh, a unified or, let's say, a complementary uh, market, plain and simple. That's, that's the way I see it, at least. And we've always seen that this thing will only complement each other. Whatever, whatever benefits, for example, um, people staying, for example, in Saudi experiencing that will only come and benefit us as well down the road, uh, you know, in, in, in the long term. So absolutely. I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, human rights is something that's been in focus. I know you get questions a lot about this. Um, I was speaking to a colleague of yours earlier today, and I asked him, you know, is there fatigue, a sense of fatigue generally, that there has been all this uproar about human rights? Uh, and that it may, and that fatigue, you know, I wonder, could that be damaging to the need to push further? Because you've always said, you know, no one's perfect. We see more yet to do. So, so what do you think? How do you overcome? Well, let me that ask you this fatigue? question first. What do you mean by fatigue? Fatigue from what? Fatigue from hearing uh, about criticisms. Fatigue from being in the press no. on the front pages of the UK papers. Perhaps. No, I, I think the fatigue is not from that. The fatigue is from the fact that I think of of. Um, uh, misrepresenting facts or uh, not accurately addressing what is on the ground or in some places, you know, just plain and simple misstated facts. Mm -hmm. That is where the fatigue comes from. The fatigue in terms of progressing on human rights, never. I think our commitment towards progress on this is unwavering. It's been there for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, just, just if you allow me to finish, you know, we've, we've made a lot of progress on this area. Um, I think the progress for the people on the ground, the experts on the ground, has been recognized. Mm. Um, today we are a benchmark in the region when it comes to, for example, dismantling of the kafala system, implementing uh, minimum wage, a non-discriminatory minimum wage system within the Supreme Committee today. I'm very proud to say one of our projects, or one of our initiatives, is reimbursement of recruitment fees, where businesses within the community have voluntarily come onto this or, or joined this scheme uh, and made a commitment of about $28 million, of which $22 million have already been repaid to workers. On, uh, on this recruitment fees. Now, if you compare it globally, I think Apple, since 2008, has been able to achieve about $32 million. Now, there are, these are, these are achievements that are on the ground. Um, what we, I think, you know, and, it, and it's continuing. Again, we've always said, this is not a spotlight initiative. This is not an initiative where the spotlight is on us and once it goes, we're gonna revert back. This is something that we're committed to, we've been committed to before, and we're gonna continue doing this. Uh, as I said, the fatigue comes from, unfortunately, misrepresenting facts, um, and, and that is, I think, I think where you know, sometimes you might find frustration, but on, on the topic itself, never. Well, I mean, there have been some, has been some pushback in the business community. I live here, and certainly not every business owner is happy to see legislation that allows people to change jobs freely. But, I mean, changing jobs freely is a key not only to having a free labor market, but also to, you know, be a good employer. And I think the nature of change, you'll always have, you'll always have people that will resist change. And again, I keep saying this, you know, how many books, and I'm talking probably to the business community to address this, you know, in your MBAs and whatnot, how many books have you looked at which talks about organizational change and how you need to create organizational change and how do you need to overcome resistance within organizations when you come to restructuring? And if we address this, if you talk about organizations of 1,500 people, 2,000 people, then when you implement legislation that has social impact, that has economic impact, it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, legislative impact, there is no doubt that you will find people that will resist the change. But right. the fact is, the government has been unwavering in implementing it. We, I think, need to address and find more innov innovative ways of getting the business people and the business community on board. But if, I, if you allow me to, again, use the example of the $28 million commitment from the business community, this is not something that we imposed on the business community. This is not something that we twisted their arms to do. This is something that they willingly came on and, 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 and agreed to join. This $28 million comes from the business community to reimburse recruitment fees for workers, which has shifted the burden of proof, which previously happens, I think, in most other nations, from worker to, to, to the business community and, and to the business owners. If that showcases anything, it's that if you create the right environment, uh, people are willing and more, more, more uh, uh, committed towards uh, moving forward and doing the right thing. Yes or no, would it be helpful if the multinational brands who own food chains, uh, hotel chains, if they turn up the screws on some local business owners as, as well to make sure that they're keeping up with the, well, the so, but, well, international boss? Just so we're clear, the assumption then means that it's, it's not the, you know, the, big, the big brands that are, are you know, not committed. I mean, I think there's a lot of... 
We've seen a lot of reports where big brands, them, big brands themselves find ways of, you know, or loopholes uh, throughout, uh, you know, throughout their, their, their business practices. And again, this is not just in Qatar. No, no, We've not in Qatar. seen these reports really. internationally. And I think this is where I think it's very, very important to focus on. The country since before the World Cup has been committed on labor reforms. Since the World Cup, the World Cup acted as a vehicle and as an accelerator, not only on labor reforms, but on a lot of different other issues, infrastructure pro projects and so on. But labor reforms is where legacy is already being delivered before the tournament. It is something that we've stepped up to. We've engaged with our critics. Today, some of our most ardent critics are our most ardent supporters, and that needs to be recognized. And I think, it, I think you know, th there's, uh, uh, there's merit in recognizing, but more importantly, Again, you know, if you look at the ILO, if you look at ITUC, if you look at the trade unions, they all recognize the work that has been done. Some other human fan experience stuff that I know is challenging, um, you know, rainbow flags. Okay, they have to be in the stadium. FIFA said yes, they must be in the stadium. But we heard some from a, a security official here saying, you know, people who carry rainbow flags could be attacked, therefore we're going to take them away. Uh, are they going to be allowed in the street? And are you going to allow protests generally? Yes or no on that, I think. Protests? Yeah. Protests for what? I mean, I think, you know, this is... This Demonstrations. Is, this is, well, this is, a, yeah. this is a tournament for celebration. This is a football tournament. Yeah, but this people, always, people always find stuff to protest about, and I think there are I a couple issues here, I think everyone is looking for somebody too. to protest. Is that <laughs> <right>? <laughs> no, look, I think, I think, again, you know, from day one, we've always said football has a very, very, very uh, uh, powerful ability to bring people together. You see it in many different tournaments. We've, seen, we've experienced it in 2010 in South Africa. You know, the Rainbow Nation getting together. Everybody from, you know, the African nation supporting Ghana when it got to the, to the, to the semifinals, uh, the quarterfinals. And the reality is, you know, this tournament, the first World Cup in the Arab world, the first World Cup in the Middle East, it offers us a very unique opportunity for people from different walks of life to be able to come, engage in our common passion, which is football, Celebrate it. Fair enough, it might be celebrating different teams, but if you've ever been to a World Cup, it's always a celebratory event. It's always a festive event. And in there, and getting to know on a human-to-human -human level, on a person-to-person -person level, you get to know that, yes, we do come from different walks of life. People have different, uh, different ways of life, different, you know, different, different values, different starting points of values. But it means that we can still be able to celebrate our common humanity and our, and our passion for the game. So if one fan wants to go out and their way of life is going out with a sign but on the street and just standing there, and, every, you know, is every, that okay? Every, every visitor that, you know, again, it's, it's simple. You know, what we say is everybody's welcome, but in, in appreciating where you're coming from, you know, for us, you know, we have, we have a very rich culture. We ask for people to respect our culture. And I don't think it's much to ask for that. You know, it's as simple as that. You know, you can come, enjoy football, get to know who we are, get to know us on a, on a, on a deeper level, get to know us on, on, on you know, Go out, uh, uh, celebrate the games. You know, ce ce celebrate what's it called? What's happening on the pitch? And through that, I think there there there'll be uh, uh, an exchange of cultures, an exchange of backgrounds, and understanding different opinions and different different ways of life, and and appreciating that yes, we do have different ways of life, and that is that is you know, that is a reality, and it's not something that's unique to Qatar. It's something that's you know shared with many many different people from different uh, different parts of the region as well. One thing that you think has changed. Oh, uh, thank you. I did not expect that, but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, lastly, and we're running out of time, I just want to know the top thing that you think has changed about Qatar since 2010 when you won the, the, the bid. You think, as, I mean, well, you know, keeping in mind the events that we've had to go through since 2010, I don't think the World Cup is the only one that's, uh, that's implemented the change. But I think, look, the one thing I will say is this, uh, you know, uh, the last 10 years have been a testimonial and... Uh, a bright spotlight that, that kind of showcased our resourcefulness, our resilience, our adherence in our, to, to, to our values, um, and our commitment to progress. And I think more importantly as well, our commitment and recognition of our role to be played in the global community. Mm -hmm. We recognize that we are part of the global community. We recognize that we have responsibilities towards the global community, but more importantly, I think also uh, uh, you know, rights uh, towards ourselves as well. And you know, I think what the World Cup has been able to showcase is, you know, we've been, we've been part of the uh, uh, social discussion and discourse over the last 10 years. What I hope is, you know, by November, people will be able to come, not only, again, not only experience Qatari hospitality, not only experience Qatari culture, but the Arab world. And what I hope is by the end of it, when people leave, 
they'll be able to really appreciate and, you know, hopefully bonds be created, you know, stronger bond be created on a human to human level, right? I'm not talking, you know, fan to fan level. Right, right. I'm not talking about ideologies. I'm not talking about speeches. I'm not talking about big newspaper headlines. I'm talking about the person in Norway being able to pick up the phone and call somebody here to wish them a happy Eid, or somebody in Egypt being able to pick up the phone and call somebody else and wish them Merry Christmas. These bonds that hopefully last and we're able to build upon for the future. Inclusivity to a degree. Thank you, Hassan. Thank I appreciate you. always getting your update. Thank you. Five months. Five months. Thank you very much. Thank you.